Good Ready? afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn series. My name is Steve Mahoney. I'm joined with uh, by Kathleen Thompson and Jag Dalal from Score Greater Hartford. Today is the first in our class, uh, our series called Startup School for New Business Owners. This is a series designed to help you either you're just starting out or you've been in business for just a little bit of time or you're not even sure if you want to start your own business to help cover a number of topics across the spectrum of running a business and help you through that decision process. Um, this is the first of our class uh, of our series. You can see the other topics that we've got over the next few weeks. If you have not registered for these, you can do so uh, via the score.org website. And we'll also send you um, information tomorrow about how to do that. So we're going to start with what we like to call the myths and facts of owning a business. Now, if you've been in business for a little bit, or you've already started this process, you're going to probably realize pretty quickly that these are all myths, right? Um, you may think that you're not going to have to work a lot of hours or put in a lot of hard work, um, but you probably realize pretty quickly that that's not the case when you run your own business. Somehow, sometimes people figure out that pretty early on that they do actually have more competition than they think. Um, sometimes they, they think that their product or service is so unique that they really don't have any competition, but they'll learn quickly that that's not the case. Um, another common myth, I think, is that when people feel like they are going to run their own business, they say, well, I want to be my own boss. I don't want to have a boss. Um, but you soon realize that your customers are your bosses um, and they can be pretty demanding. And then we've got some other ones on here as well. As you think about, you know, clearly you can't just relax after a year and enjoy the profits. You're going to have to work hard at it day in and day out. And I think this last one is really important and that a lot of business owners think that they've got to get it. They've got to do everything themselves and they've got to get it right every time. And that's not the case. Um, there's a lot of support you can find to help run your business and every business owner makes mistakes. Um, so as we go through this, if you have questions or comments as we go through this uh, topic today, please feel free to chime in. So these are a lot of myths. What are some of the facts? Well, there are a lot of emotional ups and downs in owning a business. And I would get best guess that a lot of you as you go through this experience are going to feel like one of the two people in this picture on the right hand side. Some days you're going to feel like the woman on the right who is having the time of her life and enjoying it. And there's other days where you're going to feel like the woman on your left and it's not going to be so enjoyable. Um, but one thing that I found uh, that I liked about this picture is that you notice that the woman on the right who is enjoying herself is holding the hand of the woman who is not enjoying herself. And I think that was symbolic of the fact that as a business owner, there's a lot of support you can get um, to help you through this journey. So you're not alone. Um, and as you go through this, you may decide maybe owning a business isn't right for me. And that's okay because it's not for everybody. So as we go through this series, we're going to talk about two entrepreneurs um, that we're going to cover through the vast majority of the topics we're going to cover over the next few weeks. The first is named Sarah. She loves pets. She's got a few of them herself. She recently adopted a couple animals, and she decided she wants to start a business involving animals. She doesn't really know what it is yet. She's not really sure what her business idea is, but she's so passionate about animals, she thought, maybe I could do something with this passion of mine. And then there's Homer. Homer is a very caring person. He loves to care for people. He's very good at it. And he thought, if I could just harness my strength into running a business, could I make a living out of this? Could I make something out of this passion and skill set that I have? So both of them are at this fork in the road in their lives, trying to figure out, what do I want to do? Do I want to run a business? And if so, how can I do it? So what we're going to talk about today are what we call the big questions, the key questions that every business owner needs to think through as they're going to go down this journey. We're going to start with motivation. As you think about starting a business and jumping into this, this adventure, a key question to ask yourself is, what's my motivation? And you'll see on the, the first couple of bullets here, somewhat organized around your financial motivation. If this is going to be your primary source of income or even a secondary source of income, how you answer those questions may result in dramatically different efforts in terms of how you want to run your business and what your strategy is going to be. Maybe you want this to just be a hobby. You want it to be a little bit of a side hustle. And if you can make some money, great. But if you can't, no big deal. Um, maybe there's a family business and you've been tasked with taking it over and you think, wow, it's my responsibility to take over the business for the family. I've got a lot of work to do. Maybe you're passionate about creating jobs. Maybe you want to build something that will help the community and create some employment. Maybe you're not really sure what you want to do yet, but you know you want to be the captain of your own ship. And maybe you've got really ambitious goals, like you want to change the world. So understanding your motivation can be a really key aspect before you jump in and decide you want to start your own business. 
As mentors, we like to start our clients off with this question. What's your big idea? What are you going to do in your business that's going to resonate with customers and defeat the competition? So we think through a business model. How are you going to create and deliver value for your customers? How are you going to make money? What is your business model going to be? Value proposition, incredibly important. What's the product or service that you're going to offer to your customers and how are they going to find it valuable and choose you as the business to go to? And then thinking about the trends that might impact your business. I've got a client right now who was just giving an example recently of how she's had to course correct her business so many times over the last few years because of trends in the market. Um, so this is just something that business owners constantly face. And then what's your strategy? How are you going to think about evolving your business through the changing market dynamics and your own changes as a business owner? You're going to hear more about Sarah and Homer as they think through this product clarity decision in Wednesday's class coming up. Next big question, who is your target customer? This is really important to define your target customer as specifically as possible. If you're too broad, you're going to have a hard time finding them where they are, and you're going to have a hard time resonating with them, what your product or service is going to be, and sticking out from the competition. Because quite frankly, if you don't know who they are, how are you going to sell to them? So defining your target customer is going to be really important. And then what's the problem you're going to solve for them? This, these two questions go hand in hand whenever we're talking with clients. These questions get coupled together. Who's your target customer? What problem are you going to solve for them? So this goes regardless if you've got a product or a service. Uh, this is a key question that you'll have to answer. Um, and then putting yourselves in the shoes of the customer. Is it important and valuable to your target customer, what you're offering? And not only that, but do you have the knowledge and experience to solve it? If you're a service provider, are you going to be something that your client is going to say, wow, I really want to go to this person because they are the expert in their field and they know um, they know what to do to solve my problem? So as we get into uh, next week's session um, on finding your target customer, you're going to get some tools around this, um, some resources to think through, how to do market research. We've also got a business positioning template that we think will be really helpful for you as you think through answering this question. Who is your competition? This one can be really tricky because when you're thinking through your big idea and you think about your customers and what you can offer, um, your competition could be any number of different businesses. It could be established businesses that have been around for a long time. It could be others in the startup world that are have capitalized a growing trend and think that they can you know, jump in and start their own thing as well. Uh, it could also be a completely new business model. Maybe you've got an idea for something that could be um, you know, dramatically different than what's offered today. Um, my best advice when thinking through this is to think really broadly in how you answer this question. Um, I would say as we talk to our clients about this, um, you know, when we're going through this competitive edge question, we ask about competition, a lot of times we'll hear that, well, I don't really have any competition. But when we start poking and prodding a little bit more, we find that there's more than they may have thought of. Um, I work in the health insurance industry for a number of years, and we actually faced something like this for a long period of time where, you know, there's a period of time where we said, well, our competition is just the other health insurers. And then we started to see that there were some really big companies getting into the health space, maybe not health insurance, but Apple developed the Apple Watch. And all of a sudden they started tracking health data to try to sell to their clients. They could improve their health output, their outcomes. Uh, Amazon decided to get into the pharmaceutical delivery system and started, they bought up a, a pharmacy company and started filling prescriptions. All of a sudden there were some really big players that we wouldn't think of being in the health insurance industry. We realized, wow, these guys are our competition when you think broadly. So that's my best piece of advice as you think about answering that question. Much like the previous two questions where we talked about who's your target customer, what's the problem you're going to solve? The competition question, there's another coupling question that goes with this. Not only who is your competition, but how are you going to differentiate from them? Um, so you can see the different options that are out here. Are you going to be better, faster, cheaper? Do you have your secret sauce? If you're a retail location or a service industry, like a, a garage shop, is location going to be um, the differentiator for you? Um, you know, this is going to be tricky to do as well. Um, putting yourselves in the shoes of the customer and thinking, how am I going to differentiate 
from from my competition and get my customers in to see why I'm a better suit for them. Um, one thing that I will give you a piece of advice on, um, there are times we hear clients say, well, you know, I'm better than the competition because I'm really passionate about my business. Every business owner is passionate about their business. That's not really a differentiator. It's good that you're passionate about your business because that shows you're energetic and you are driven to succeed, but it's not necessarily a differentiator. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about answering this, this key question. As we go through the next topic, you, you've got your target customer, you know what the competition is, you know how you're going to differentiate. How do you find and connect them? How do you connect with your target customer? And this really depends on your industry. It depends on where you are and what your service offering is. Some approaches still work for business models. Some things face-to-face -face still works. Um, you know, sometimes if your client base is of a certain generation or a certain demographic, they may still listen to the radio. They may still see things on, on TV or print advertising, uh, depending upon where they're looking for their services. But the clear priority right now for all businesses is digital marketing. It's table stakes for all businesses. Having a website, having uh, social media marketing, um, even inbound marketing, which could be a, a kind of different way to get your business name out there, whether you put free product out there so clients can learn about your business, whether you go on a podcast, whether you uh, teach a webinar, just to get your business name out there. Those are some examples of inbound marketing. But having the um, the online presence is really important because anytime you hear about a business, think that you've never tried before, whether it's a restaurant or a chiropractor or whatever, you're going to think to yourself, well, I'm going to go on Google and see what their Google reviews are. If you've got an online presence, people will be able to read about you. Um, this other question about social media marketing is really important. Where do your target customers hang out? I'm not a marketing expert, but I can give you an easy example. Um, knowing where your clients are going to find your business is really important. So an easy example would be if you're in the financial planning business and your target clients are retirees or people approaching retirement age and you want to do financial planning for them, my guess is you're not going to find them on TikTok. So maybe you need to think about a different place to go. So that's just a, an easy, extreme example. But that's the concept of where do your target customers hang out and where can you find them? Now, we're going to go more into this topic. Um, next week, we've got um, Kathleen is going to be teaching a, a topic on marketing and sales, where she's going to talk about all these concepts of the importance of marketing and how to make that sale. So next key aspect of thinking through running your business is your personal skills and experience, your expertise. Clients are selective. They want to know what the experience level is of the person. If you're going to go to a massage therapist or a chiropractor, you're going to want to understand what's their experience. Not only are there reviews, what, how long have they been in business? What's their education background? What's your proven track record to be able to deliver customers, to be able to come in and give your business a try? Um, thinking through the value proposition that I mentioned a little while ago, aligning your skills with that value proposition, super important. Um, because that's going to help demonstrate to the clients that you've got those skills that they're looking for, and it's going to deliver the value and help solve their problem. As I mentioned a little while ago, passion's important, but you've got to have the skills and you've got to have the sales expertise to deliver those sales. Um, and then the other way to think about this, I'll talk about this in a minute, but where you've got some knowledge or experience gaps, how can you fill those in? And there are ways to do that. Um, to think about resources or learning that you can do um, because everybody's going to be learning, right? No business owner is perfect as they think about what they have to offer. So as you think about the skills and experience that you have um, currently and what you need to succeed, understanding that gap is going to be important. All right, the financials, how are you going to make money? We're going to talk about financial management in a few classes and I'll talk a little bit about understanding your financial statements. We'll talk a little bit about pricing and budgeting and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, how are you going to make money? How are you going to earn revenue? Are you going to charge, um, if you're in the service industry, are you going to charge an hourly rate? Um, maybe you're going to charge per month, per day. Uh, if you're making a product, are you going to charge per whatever your widget is, whatever your product is? Or is it going to be based on a business result? Like if you can achieve a certain amount of savings for a client as a consultant, you'll get a percentage of those savings. Maybe you've got a subscription model. Maybe you've got an education 
program where you're teaching um, a number of people and your business model is going to be based on a subscription service. Um, or if you've got a, if you're on a commission business, like in the real estate market, maybe it's a percentage of something. So understanding how your revenue is going to be defined. A lot of this could be how you think you can charge for your service. And also if there's a competitive landscape in terms of how the market typically handles your service or product. Um, finding the right price is really important um, as you think through this. You know, we'll talk a little bit about pricing in the in the financial management topic, but there's this concept of pricing elasticity. And this is an economic term. And what that means is, you know, think if you think about the tension between a buyer and seller in terms of price as the tension of a rubber band, um, you know, pulling, uh, two people pulling against each other, you know, the, the business wants to charge more so they can earn more. The customer is only going to pay so much before they decide either A, they're going to go to a competitor for a better price, or B, the service is just too expensive, they can go without it. So when that pricing elasticity stretches beyond the point where the customer says no, the rubber band breaks. So as a business owner, the tricky part is finding where you can price your product or service in a reasonable basis such that you can still sell enough to clients that they're going to value your product or service at that price point. Uh, but if you go too low, you may not make enough money to earn a living. So that's a very tricky um, proposition. There's no easy answer to it. Um, you know, recommendation that we have for a lot of people is shop the competition, understand not just what they're charging, but how different their service or product might be from yours. If it's an apples to apples, then maybe it's it's okay to just compare the raw price, but you may offer something a little bit more and maybe you can charge a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, thinking through if you're charging enough and earning enough to make a living, that kind of goes back to that that slide a few slides ago about motivation. Um, if this is going to be a secondary source of income and you're thinking, I'm going to keep my full-time job, but I'm going to start this business and I'm hoping to earn a little bit of money, I'm going to see if there's a there there. I'm going to just kind of road test this, see if there's demand for this, see if I can make a little money at it. And if I can, great. Maybe I can scale back my hours, my full-time job and ramp this business up. Um, but that's tricky. If you're trying this to be your primary source of income, there's a lot more pressure on it. So thinking through this concept actually leads into the next topic, which is, is your business scalable? Um, so what does this mean? Well, this goes back to how big of a business do you need it to be or want it to be at what pace? You need to think through if it's a, if it's a service business, for instance, how many clients are there? that are going to be in the need of my services and how many clients can I serve per day, per week, per month? Um, some businesses can be scaled more quickly than others. Uh, manufacturer products, software, um, services may be tricky because you may offer a service to a client and they may not need you, you know, more than once a month or once a quarter, which means you've got a lot of, find a lot more clients to serve every day, every week, every month and keep them coming back depending upon what your service is. Um, you know, if you're doing, if you're starting up a hobby business and you're selling craft items, that may not be that scalable because you have to ask yourself, for instance, how many items can I make per day? Not only how many can I sell, but how many can I physically make per day? And even if you're in the service industry, you know, if you've got a, a service office opening, how many clients can I see per day? If I fully book up, wh what's the maximum number I could see? And then I've got this bullet down here at the bottom that says, do the math right? Your price per unit of product or your service hour, hourly rate, let's say, your price times the number of units equals your revenue. Your revenue minus expenses equals your profit. And asking yourself, how scalable does your business need to be? Um, you know, you can say to yourself, I can make, you know, 10 widgets per day, or I can see 10 clients per day, but be reasonable in terms of thinking through how much you can actually do each week, each month, every week, every month. Um, so that's the scalable um, uh, concept right there. Speaking of finances, asking yourself, do you have the financial resources that you're going to need? Um, so some of this comes back to um, what your income needs are going to be and what your startup expenses are going to be. And do you are you going to have to spend a lot of money to get your business off the ground even before you earn a dollar of revenue? Can you 
you know, until your business takes off and you can start earning a profit, do you have enough income to live on? Um, if you've got your primary job and you're going to do this off to the side, great. That can help keep you doing that. Bigger demand on your personal life, but financially it might be okay. So doing the math is really important. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the financial management. We're going to talk about cash flow budgeting, not only every month once you're in operations, but more about like how much money do you need to get your business going before you earn that first dollar of revenue. Last bullet here, funding sources. Do you have realistic expectations about funding sources? A lot of times we talk to our clients about what we call the three Fs, founders, friends, and families. So founders being yourself as the business owner, putting your own money in, doing a lot of the work yourself in the form of sweat equity. Um, maybe you can tap into some friends or family members who might loan you some money, or maybe they'd be willing to invest a little bit to help get your business started. That's where a lot of people start when they're getting, when they're just starting out with their own business, the majority of their funding is going to be from founders, families, and friends. You may go to a bank looking for a loan. It's hard to get a loan as a startup business without a long track record. Um, that being said, you can, you, you know, loans are possible, right? Banks will talk to you. They're going to want to see a business plan. They're going to want to understand your, your strategy, your product, your service, what's your pricing strategy, marketing, what's your budget, um, because they're investing in you and they're going to want to make sure that they can get a return on that investment and that you'll pay back the loan with interest. Um, then there's investors. You could find somebody to try to invest in your business. With that, they'd be taking a piece of the equity of your business, right? They may say, I'll invest $10,000, but I want to own 20% of your business and 20% of your profits going forward. Um, so that's how an investor would work. Grants are very challenging. They are out there. Um, there's a lot of grants that um, people can look for and find. They're just very competitive because a lot of people are applying for them. Encourage you to research them, apply for them, but don't count on them because they're very difficult to get. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on financial resources in this series, but we do have a Lunch and Learn series coming in April that is called uh, Financing Tools for Your Business. Um, we're going to be promoting that in the next week or so. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. We're going to be talking about all aspects of uh, financing for your business. And we've got people talking about grants, crowdfunding, traditional bank loans, uh, all sorts of other topics. So be on the lookout for that one. So you got all these things that are going on in your mind. I got to figure out my customer, my competition. I got to figure out the finances, the marketing, the sales. Oh my God, how am I going to do all this? What are all the things you have to do as a business owner? So there's a lot of things on the page here. And some of these you may not have to do on day one, but if you look at what's out here, you've got an operations function, which involves you know producing your product, um, handling supplies with um, you know people that are helping you with your inventory or raw materials if you're in a manufacturing space, um, finance, accounting, HR, if you've got to hire employees or contractors, there's work associated with that. Maybe you've got to work with an attorney to understand the legal aspects or compliance aspects of your business. Then there's marketing and sales, right? Actively marketing to your clients, finding your clients, making the sale and customer service. You got to keep the clients happy as you're going through, you know, day to day meeting their needs. And then there's R&D. Well, you may think that R&D is only applicable for like the IT world or, or like a highly specialized manufacturing world. Um, it could be for a service business. If you want your service to stay competitive, you have to prove that you've got the cutting edge service and expertise that your clients are going to want. It's a lot on the page. How do you figure out how to do all this? Well, you could hire some employees or contractors. Um, that's one option. Costs you some money, but you might need to do that. Um, you might be able to find some free help online or some other you know help that you can pay for online. Um, a score mentor is actually, we help our clients a lot. We don't do the work uh, for our clients, but we help coach and mentor them. But you can find other, you know, online help um, for maybe some area of expertise that you don't have. And that would be especially important for an area like accounting, bookkeeping, or if you need an attorney, or if you want someone to handle, if you've got, you know, a lot of IT issues, maybe you've got a lot of customer data. If you're in the healthcare space and you've got um, you know, private health information of your of your clients. Very important that you secure that data. Having an IT resource and somebody who can manage your cyber risk, very important to do. So that's where you 
are going to probably have to lean on somebody outside to help you with that. Or you could do everything yourself, which is not easy because you're one person and there's only so many hours in the day. And unless your business is a cloning machine, it's really hard to do all this stuff yourself. So thinking through the resources and how you can find the resources you need to help you out and how at what pace you want to scale your business and bring those resources on. A lot of times our clients, um, we find that the biggest thing they need help with is thinking through the marketing and sales strategy. But when they get to critical mass, they need an accountant, they need a lawyer, they may need somebody to handle their IT needs, depending upon their business. Business planning, topic that comes up a lot. Do you need a business plan? Answer is it depends. Um, our recommendation when you're starting out, it's a good way to start with a one pager. Um, it's a it's a way to, and we'll give you a template for this um, as part of the series. It's a way for you to collect your thoughts, get organized about what you want your business to be. It tackles things like what's your value proposition? What's your marketing strategy? Who is your customer? What problem are you solving for them? Who's your competition? How are you going to differentiate yourself? All the big questions we've talked about. And a one pager could be just for you when we think about who the audience is for a business plan. Um, in fact, when you start with a business plan, it's primarily for you to start to help get yourself organized and think through what your thoughts are going to be. Um, I'd recommend um, starting with a one pager in the sense that it gets things down on paper and you can just start with bullets. It doesn't have to be a lengthy you know, narrative kind of thing. That being said, if you're going to want to go to a bank, if you're going to want to talk to investors about investing in your business, you're going to need something more comprehensive. Um, and that's where you can start using templates that are out there. We've got some on our website that you could check out. Um, there's a lot of, if you wanted to try using an AI tool like ChatGPT to help you with kind of the brainstorming aspects of writing, um, you know, that can help generate some thoughts as you think about um, uh, writing your business plan. Wouldn't recommend you solely rely on that because it's got to be personalized for you. Um, but they, you know, a tool like that can help um, kind of in the idea generation phase of writing a business plan. The other important thing to think about a business plan is we call it a living, breathing document in the sense that it's always going to be changing because business conditions are going to change. You may find that your strategy up front was to sell this certain product or service, but as a few months go by, you may find that the customer's are valuing something a little bit differently and you've got to change course. Understanding your business plan and what the goals are and being willing to modify it as things change is really important. So you're going to iterate a little bit. One draft is never enough. You're going to want to think through what are the different ways things have changed and how do I refresh what I'm doing? You don't need to look at your business plan every day, but as conditions warrant and at least every couple months or so, you're going to want to think through, am I on the right path or do I need to course correct? You should always expect to make changes because it never works out perfectly the way uh, it starts. The one page template that we'll share with you, um, you know, sometimes we'll talk with clients and they'll say, I've got like two or three ideas and they're dramatically different from each other. And they're like, I kind of want to start a business here or I kind of want to start a business here. Our advice is do a one pager for each idea, because if they're separate and distinct from each other, you're going to want to organize your thoughts on what that business could look like separately. So one page business plan, it's a good way to start as things grow and you start to need more resources and share it with people, you're going to probably need something a little more comprehensive. So as we talk through our job at SCORE and our clients, we support and help them, but we're also trying to be realistic with them. So th this is what I call kind of the truth in advertising slide where businesses do fail, right? It's hard to start a business and be successful. And just some stats you can see in the top here that um, according to the SBA and the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, 20% fail in the first year, 50% by the fifth year. Most common reasons cited. A lot of the things we talked about and we're going to talk about through this series, right? Not understanding the market, right? Not understanding your product or service. And that's why it's important to be able to course correct because you may have an idea up front and it may not be right, but if you can course correct and understand where the market is going and helping to meet that client's need, that can help you be more successful. Run out of cash, right? Having a good understanding of how much money it's going to take, not only to get this thing started, but to run it for a longer period of time. Having the wrong team. 
Now, on the surface, you may think, well, I'm not hiring any employees. I'm going to do this myself. Team could mean a lot of things. It could mean, you know, it could be an employee. It could be a contractor. It could just be an advisor, a mentor, an accountant that you consult with once or twice a year, a business attorney who reviewed a lease for you or who reviewed the employee contract or employer contract that you're going to work with a client on. Um, that Think about the team as the extension of all of the resources um, that are going to help you in your business. Outcompeted. Another reason. So we think through like how you're going to differentiate yourself from the competition and then pricing and cost issues. And this will be something we'll talk about in the financial management, understanding the profitability of your business, how you price your product, thinking through variable costs versus fixed costs. Um, a lot of things can go into that, that equation. Market risk and execution risk, right? Understanding the market, being able to execute against that and being able to go where the market is going, right? Staying ahead of things. Um, and then, um, the last one is it requires a lot. I think about it, owning your own businesses, like the treadmill is always on. It's just a matter at what speed it's going. Um, and then you'll see this depiction over on the right that I think kind of sums it up well is that, you know, you kind of try, then you fail, you try, then you fail, then you try, you know, you keep going back and then eventually you get to success. And there's probably an extra arrow here that shows that even when you get to success, things are going to continue to change. And you may have to go back to trying again and trying something new and different. So thinking about this as an evolving process as running a business, you know, the treadmill is always going to, to continue the analogy. So as we think about wrapping this up, and then I want to take some questions as we as we um as we wrap up in a little bit. There's a lot here, right? And you think to yourself, oh my God, you just threw in 30 questions that we've got to think about. You're not going to know all the answers to them on day one. You're not going to know all of them in a week. Some of them you may not know for a few months until you're in your business, but understanding what you want out of the business, your motivation, your big idea, how to find your customer, how to define and find your customer, and then thinking through the marketing and sales strategy and, and thinking through the financial aspects, understanding all those things and kind of which direction you think you're going to go can help you answer this question about whether or not you want to take the leap and start a business and be a CEO. Now, based on the poll question, a lot of you are either thinking about it or just starting out. So some of these questions may have been eye-opening. Some of them you may have been thinking about already and just don't know how to answer them. Um, and we're hopefully going to help you through that over the next couple of weeks. Um, and if it's not right for you, that's okay. Um, some people decide, I don't really want to start my own business. I don't really want to run my own business, but I want to be the second in command to somebody. Um, or maybe I want to be a specialist in something and, and have like a really major role um, and consult with kind of other people, but being a CEO is not necessarily for me. But if you do, if you want to jump into that, these are some key questions, right? Having a game plan, having a strategy, understanding the market. And that's not a, that's not a question that gets answered only once, right? Because the market is always changing. Having the required knowledge and skills of your business and the passion to do it every day having the required capital, right? That's all about the financial aspect of it. And then the persistence required to be successful. So those are just some key things as you kind of take away from this. Wow, this sounds really exciting. I've got a lot of key questions to answer. We're going to be back on Wednesday to go through, you know, more, more topics and more details, but you don't have to have all those questions answered right away. A score mentor can actually help you think through a lot of these questions. Um, and you're going to find that you know, a lot of these, a lot of these key issues you're going to solve over time. Um, thinking about kind of moving down a, a highway and many lanes, moving down on the highway of solving those questions as you as you get more experience. So, what do we have coming up next? Um, these are the rest of the topics that we've got, and today's class was more of a way to think. Have you start thinking about a lot of these key issues, asking yourself these key questions. What are the ones that I know I'm in pretty good shape on? And what are the ones that I know I've got to dig deeper on because I'm a little bit weaker? So as you think about these, these topics and go through this, maybe go back and, and you'll get the, the presentation tomorrow. Maybe go through the document and think to yourself, if I had to rate myself on a scale of one to 10, what are the areas that I am really lacking on that I've got to improve on? And what are the ones that I think I've got nailed pretty good? Um, so these are the topics that we've got um, set up for the rest of the series over the next couple of weeks. On Wednesday, um, we're going to be talking about using Sarah and Homer as specific examples. We're going to go deeper on a lot of these topics over the next couple of weeks. The first one is how to define your product and service. 
We've got some folks who are on the series, who are on the on the call right now, who are in the product business and some in the service business. We figured that was the case. So we're actually going to cover both because they operate very differently from each other. So we're going to talk about a product business and a service business and how to think about identifying and defining that product or service for your customers. Next Monday, we're going to talk about finding your target customer, market research tools, how to think about the funnel of information that's out there and how to narrow in and finding your target customer. Then we're going to go into marketing and sales, right? You've defined your product or service. You figured out how to find your target customer. And now you're going to go market and sell to them. Business and capital management is super important for the success of a business, both on the startup phase and long-term phase. So we'll go through that uh, in our fifth class. And then the last one, I would consider a lot of the intangible skills of running a business, prioritization, task management. Um, there's only so many hours in the day, but how can you think about prioritizing things and getting everything done that you need to? We got a lot of resources here, a lot of information on the page. Don't worry, you're going to get a list of these. Um, and if, if you didn't, uh, if you missed this at the beginning, we'll have a link to a resource website where you're going to get the documents and templates and links to all of these things that we're sharing throughout the series. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, but just a couple that I'll mention now, um, you'll get uh, the one page business plan that I mentioned earlier and an additional document that has some guidance about writing a business plan, uh, which I think you'll find helpful. Um, there's a great podcast that Kathleen recommended called How I Built This. Um, it's kind of a lot of different examples and stories about entrepreneurs and how they, how they started. Uh, whatever their idea was. Um, the SCORE website is a great resource. Um, you can sign up for a mentor there. Um, we've got workshops and on-demand uh, recordings of training uh, webinars. And then we've got a number of tools and templates that you can uh, access for free. Uh, the SBA, sba.gov is a great website um, to access information um, about how to, uh, their lender match program is a good way to think about finding a financing resource for your business. Um, and they've got just a number of resources, especially in some specialized things like government contracting. Um, we, As we were mapping out this series, we decided not to spend a lot of time on some of the transactional type things like getting a license or a permit or figuring out sales tax and you know how to start, you know, register your business because you can do all that through the Connecticut business website, which is very good. It's business.ct.gov. Um, we thought we would spend a lot of our time on what we consider the more strategic aspects of running your business, like marketing and sales and um, product and, and customer uh, identification. But you can go to business.ct.gov to check out information on those topics. And then just some other uh, community partners, uh, in addition to SCORE, um, that can be helpful depending upon the nature of your business. The Women's Business Development Council, um, the Small Business Development Center, and then the Community Economic De uh, Development Fund um, is another great resource, uh, not only for helping with financing, but they also have a continuing education program on their website as well. Um, so you can check them out. And the last one is Google. Um, knowing how to search, of course, most efficiently is, is the best way to go, but um, you can really get a lot of resources out there um, when you're when you're searching through Google and YouTube. Uh, another good way to, to learn you know, different softwares or get reviews on different things. So um, just a handful of resources, but just kind of the first of many to come as we as we go through the next couple of weeks. So with that, I think we can open it up for Q and A. Any questions that folks have, and before we jump full into the Q and A, um, Kathleen has a brief poll about obtaining a score mentor. If you are interested in getting a score mentor, um, click yes to the second question, and we will reach out to you on the best way to do that. Um, we will only email you once. You will not get bombarded with a lot of emails. Um, and if you don't, that's fine as well. But we wanted to offer up that service and give you some uh, advice on how to do that. So Kathleen, with that, are there any questions that have come in from the group in the Q&A box or anything else that you've added to what we've talked about today? There are no open questions at present. Many of them were about score mentoring and stuff like that. So I answered them while you were talking. So the floor is open in terms of the Q&A box is wide open for anyone to ask specific questions about your own business, if you would like, or general questions about what Steve just said. And we just got one. So far, I have registered the business, built and launched my own website as well as a business. Can you please tell me some great ways to advertise it to a local area? 
I will use newspapers, flyers, and Facebook. Any other suggestions, please? Do you have some advice on that, Kathleen? You're, it's probably more your area expertise than mine. Well, it's going to depend on what it is you're doing. Perhaps you could say what it is you're doing, whether it's a product or a service. Because if it's a service, I really am telling many of my clients that was that one of the best ways early on is to do things live and in person with people and network with real people in real life. Because anything you do, anything you do online, unless you already have a large following personally, which doesn't always translate to your business if they don't need what you do, it can be, it can take a long time. There's a lot of lead time to build that online because you're starting from scratch. So like I often service. suggest people go, yeah, he says it's a service. So this is totally applicable. I often suggest people go in person to wherever, either go to business networking events or volunteer to speak at the local library. If, some, if it's a topic you can speak about, do public speaking for free in front of groups. Another way that's possibly useful is Facebook groups because LinkedIn has groups. They're generally mostly just spamming each other, which isn't that helpful. If you find a really good LinkedIn group, that's awesome. And most of the other platforms don't really have groups like Facebook does. Whereas people who like the same topic, most of them will tell you you can't spam by publicizing yourself, but that doesn't mean you can't do some serious just helping people with information or whatever. And then some of them may message you privately and say, gee, can you help me? I would definitely start in person because it's it, it's a good way to test your market too, when you get real responses from real people and you can see their faces. All right, another person says, I was working, what if I was working with a mentor a while ago? I'm not sure if I can still work with them at this point or not. Um, well, you may not get the same mentor. You can put in another request. If it's been a while ago, the request has probably been closed and you can just put in another request. Now you can, if the person takes direct requests, you can request them directly yourself. If they don't, you can, Ask for them in your in your write-up. And if the person's available, they'll work with you again if you liked working with them. If you got as far as you felt like you could go with that person, then you're certainly welcome to work with somebody else too. But that to me would be the best bet. I agree. All right. Um, let's see. Steve, are grants the best options if you're really struggling to obtain your startup funds if you don't have any other support for selling a product? What do you think about that? Yeah, I would say grants are really challenging just due to the number that are actually out there and the number of people who are trying to apply for them. Um, so it's just, there's no other way to describe it other than it's very competitive. Um, you know, they are out there, but you've got to work at it. You've got to research it. You've got to apply for it. You got to follow up on it. Um, so yes, continue to look for them, but I wouldn't necessarily count on them. Um, you know, I, I think the, the the best option is really trying to think through, you know, financing the startup of your business yourself, or if you can tap into some some family and friends who can help you get going. Um, and then, you know, you can look at the SBA's website if you want to think about a, um, a lender, right? They have a lender match program. The SBA doesn't provide loans. Their, their, their mission is to help connect business owners with lending organizations. Um, but it's, it's challenging to get a loan as well if you don't have the track record. But um, it's worth checking out um, to see what's out there, but it, it, it can be competitive. That's all the questions we have for the moment. Oh, just roll right in right after I say that. I'm looking for more information on how I can start my own adult daycare slash home care business. I had already started looking into licensing, but I'm unsure of how I can get clients as some of them will be paid by Medicaid or care by a family member. I'm also unsure of homemakers slash payroll. Okay, there's a lot here. Um, 
All right. So yeah. So looking at the licensing and in an industry like healthcare, um, highly regulated, or uh, really any business that you're going to start, I recommend you research the Connecticut um, business website that I mentioned earlier to understand if you've got licensing requirements. Some of them may be obvious, like if you're an electrician, um, some of them may not be so obvious um, that you might need a certain license. So healthcare is definitely a highly regulated industry. So our, um, it's good that you're looking into the licensing requirement. Um, how to get your clients. I mean, this is a tricky one because um, I would look into um, programs that the state of Connecticut may have. Um, if they think about, if you, if you can become a registered um, service provider, um, in terms of um, uh, clients that they're looking with the state to place with registered service providers, um, that might be something we're looking into. Um, that's a tricky one. I can't. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. We actually have a, a a handful of folks who've got some expertise in this area or experience. I would say um, I might recommend requesting a mentor for help in the healthcare space or the home care business. Um, we might be able to pair you up with a mentor who could probably be, speak better uh, at it than I can. I'm sorry, I can't be of more help, Monica. I don't know, Kathleen, if you've got any other ideas. A couple, no, I don't have ideas per se, but just thinking about it, anytime you're going to, if you're going to take insurance, that's a decision to make. And it's, it. I don't know how long it takes to get registered to be able to take insurance. I, I know it's, it's a, somewhat cumbersome process. It is. So one option you would have would be to start not taking insurance and do private pay to begin with until you get your feet wet and then ramp up to that. When it comes to paying people, there's a certain number of hours and I or dollars where well it's pretty small where you you can just pay people Above six hundred dollars, they're a ten ninety nine. They're not necessarily an employee, so you have a decision to make as to whether they're going to be an employee with a W two, or a contractor with a ten ninety nine. And either way, you've got tax implications. Whether you have to, if if they're an employee, then you've got to withhold taxes, and if they're not, you don't. And there's a whole bunch of complexities about that. So again, I. Th think the state of Connecticut website might help and definitely Googling that stuff or yes. if a mentor knows about that because I only know enough to be dangerous. I don't yes. really know enough to actually I'm, help. I'm the same way. This goes to all this this applies to all industries, not just just the healthcare or home care space. But 